Um, Mr. Bacconi, it is time for class. Uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, happy and healthy Thursday to you. Um, a, a big day today. We are going to cover two American wars, one doctrine, one treaty, and one widely held cultural belief, Manifest Destiny, all in 20 minutes. It's going to go fast, but it's going to be thorough. I think you're going to find it interesting. I've um, been doing it, of course, all day long. It's worked pretty well. And uh, so let's just go ahead and get started. But, be, but first, uh, a couple of quick announcements. Um, the template for the AP Daily Knockoff script is now available. Click here, please, to take a look. Uh, I will have the uh, template for the slides for you on Monday. As far as the MCQ exam workshop is concerned, uh, I've rescheduled that for Monday. Our test, our unit four test is Wednesday. See you guys on Wednesday, those of you who want to be, or sorry, see you there on Monday if you want to show up for the workshop. All right, as you saw from the agenda, we are going to do a number of different questions right now. I'm going to open this up. I'm going to move to slide number 129. Slide 129, let's see if we got it. I slipped off there, 129. And we'll dig right in. Okay, here we go. 20 minutes, let's see what we can do here. Hit our mark for sure, I'm counting on it. Yesterday, uh, we started with this slide. If you recall, we looked at Key Concept 4.3, and we just really looked at those first four words, mostly. We talked about the fact that this Key Concept is referring to everything that it takes place after the Louisiana Purchase, but since it begins with following the Louisiana Purchase, we, of course, had to take a real close look at the Purchase, which we did. Now, today, what we're going to do, with the exception of one thing, this Supreme Court case down there, Worcester versus Georgia, what we're going to do, which I've put off, uh, which I'm going to have you guys do on your own, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the last part of this key concept, especially this, uh, this wording after the comma that appears following the word purchase. Take a look at this real closely. It's kind of amazing. It says, the United States, we're talking about this period of time, 1800, 1848, specifically following the purchase, or 1803, not, not that you need to know that date. But after the purchase, the United States government sought to influence and, excuse me, sought influence and control over North America and the Western Hemisphere. That's what it says right there. It's interesting. It's not just seeking influence, the government, it's also seeking control and not just over North America, but over the Western hemisphere as well. And how is it gonna do this? Well, the key concept makes it clear for us in a number of different ways, AKA a variety of means. It's gonna do this by exploration, the Lewis and Clark expedition, by way of military action, this uh, 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 Mexican-American war. It's gonna, and I should say also the War of 1812. It's going to do this by way of American Indian removal, which we did talk about yesterday, and diplomatic efforts such as the Monroe Doctrine, which we will talk about here in just a few minutes. So let's go ahead and take a look. I believe for you guys, it's going to be question number 28. And let's get to the slide that's relevant here. There we go. The War of 1812. Now, what do you need to know about the War of 1812? Well, first of all, uh, the bullet point here, a relatively little known war. You do not need to know that, but it is a, a fascinating and, and interesting side fact. Uh, most Americans know very little about this war. It's probably one of our uh, least known about wars, if you will. The next bullet point consisted of complicated causes and an inconclusive outcome. Now that is true, but if you just say that and you leave it at that, you are not going to get what you need uh, in order to be able to answer any kind of uh, serious questions as far as this war is concerned or be able to write about it in any way. 
you really have to get down a little bit deeper and explain what are we talking about when we say complicated causes and what do we mean by outcomes? As far as causes are concerned, you wanna to look to this last bullet point right here. And in there, there are actually two causes. We're gonna look at one first, this one here, Americans also resented the British impressment of American sailors and civilians. So let's kind of break that down a little bit. What was the cause of the War of 1812? American resentment for British impressment. You're gonna to wanna to work this word into your key questions. What is impressment? Well, it is the British essentially coming alongside of an American sailing vessel, oftentimes military vessel, but not necessarily, training vessel as well, and taking off of that vessel by force, American sailors and American civilians, and then requiring those sailors and civilians to work on the British vessel. Americans resented that. True, it occurred at that period of time. That's kind of how that game was played back then. But from the American standpoint, our standpoint, the British so overdid it and did it in such an annoying way. And there's some magnificent little stories within a story once you really get into this war, uh, that, that it got under our skin. Cause, if you will, number one. Second cause, Congress declared war because of resentment for Britain's interference with American international trade. Let's keep something in mind here. As we learned about earlier in the week, this period for 1800 to 1848, this is the period that saw the birth of the first American industrial revolution. And what happened as a result of that revolution? Factories were built, created, allowed to flourish in the American Northeast. And we looked at what those factories do, and we looked at some of the famous factories and so on. We also talked about the fact that in that or Northeast, because of the lumber and because of the proximity to the ocean and because of some good ports up there, America also developed a very fine ship building industry. That ship building industry ships to go out and engage in international trade. If you will, it was the first time that we challenged, seriously challenged, the British on the high seas when it came to this issue of international trade. And the British resented that. In their opinion, they were the ones who always controlled, if you will, the high seas. And so there was this clash, there was this tension. This is the, what's the phrase up here? The complicated causes of the War of 1812. And you do need to know these two, not just one, but both. And that means you definitely need to know the word, meaning of the word impressment. As far as outcomes are concerned, well, it says inconclusive. I mean, we, in essence, if you will, won the war. Let me show you a picture here, okay? This by itself should explain to you how close we came to losing the war. So no, the British did not come in and take us over again, but they did come here and they did do some serious damage. Let's, uh, let's think about this in a little different perspective right now. Take the year 1812 and, and move it back to the year 1810, round it down to 1810. Now let's take the year that the Declaration of Independence was written, 1776, and round it up to 1780. What's the difference between 1780 and 1810? And we're talking a mere, if I got my math right, 30 years. What's the point I'm making? In the 1770s, we're fighting for our independence from Great Britain. We win, surprisingly. Some people might even say miraculously. The, Brit the British had such a major fighting force, such a reputation for having such a great fighting force. We win. 
everyone, I am certain back then, or at least many smart people back then, probably concluded it's just a question of time before England comes back and takes back what they had lost. 10 years, 15 years, 20, now we've got 30. And sure enough, if you will, round two. Round two, they burn the White House down, but they don't take back what they had lost in the War of Independence. And so my point is, not only did we in that regard win the war, we were not taken back, but more importantly, as a result of us being able to fend off the British in 1812, we received and were able to establish some credibility. The other nations of the world looked at us and said, oh my gosh, they are for real. I've often wondered uh, what I would have predicted had I lived back then at the outset of the War of 1812. And I have to tell you, my guess is I would have said, oh my gosh, that's the end of that. They had a 30 year run and this thing is over. Because of this victory, surprise maybe you might say, look here, another consequence, another outcome, another result of the war was that it developed in us a strong sense, and we've talked about this already, of national pride, an era of good feeling. We talked about the development of a new national culture the Hudson River School of Art. Hey world, we feel good about ourselves. We're here to stay. We've got special things over here. We don't always need to look to you. That's your story of the War of 1812. Let's move on. Oops, sorry. We're now gonna go to the Monroe Doctrine. And for that, you're gonna have to add question 34. I somehow left it off of the questions when I created them at the beginning of the year. First and foremost, what is a doctrine? Now you're gonna hear that word a lot for the remainder of the year. Doctrine, we're gonna talk about Monroe Doctrine, Eisenhower Doctrine, Truman Doctrine, other doctrines. And almost always, what you're gonna see is that doctrine is in reference to an American president. And that's because in essence, that's what a doctrine is. Look down here, an assertion, a big, bad, bold, and I don't mean bad in a negative way, but big statement. Hey, world, listen up, says the president. I'm going to issue a doctrine. Uh, presidents issue doctrines, doctrines. Monroe issued a doctrine. And what was it? Well, we got the language right here. The American continents. There's an S after this word. Continents, meaning north central and south. The American continents, Monroe says to the world, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European power. Imagine that. 30 some odd years after we get our independence, we are saying to the world, look at this, we are saying to the world, don't come over here. Look at this cartoon, huh? Says Europe, what do you mean by off limits? Who are you to say to us off limits? You don't control this part of the world. This doesn't belong to you. Look at this cartoon, hands off, we said. That's a doctrine whether we had the ability to enforce the doctrine, whether anybody's gonna listen or not, that's not necessarily what's so important. Big bad, bold statement, AKA an assertion by the president. That is the Monroe Doctrine. We're gonna talk about it time and again, from here on out, probably all the way I think through, well, through the end of the class, I think we even mentioned it in period nine. We'll come back to it. But it's something important for you to know, and for now, this is as far as it goes. These two cartoons, if you will, or drawings, they should tell you everything that you need. Now let's go to the Mexican-American War. As I've said to before, you're never gonna to need to know dates that are not one of the 13, 14, or 15 that we've 
uh, charted out here from the very beginning. 1846 is not one of those dates, but 1848 is the end of the Mexican-American War. You will need to know that. You do not need to know that it was the first U.S. armed conflict chiefly fought on foreign soil. Interesting fact, but you don't need to know it. You do need to know it was a war between Mexico and America. You do need to know that the president at the time was James K. Polk, and Polk believed in this cultural belief, widespread cultural belief, called Manifest Destiny, which we're going to take a real close look at in just a few minutes. You also need to know that this war started over, if you will, a skirmish involving the Rio Grande River. You don't really need to know much more than that, but just that there was this dispute over territory about uh, uh, that uh, territory that nestled up alongside this river. The next thing you need to know, and it really goes to the heart of question 27, what was the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? And this is immensely important, not that Mexico lost about one third of its territory as a result of the war, but that the United States gained as a result of this treaty nearly all of present day California, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico. Please make sure that in the answer to your key questions, when you write this, you also indicate that this Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo did not include Texas. I know for a fact, I'm gonna say it right now, and over and over again, throughout the course of the year, you guys are going to tell me the treaty gave us Texas. Not true, we'll talk about Texas later on. The treaty gave California, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico. Just to see what that looks like on the map, just to see what that looks like. Now, what's interesting at this point, because we're this far along, is if I asked for you in writing or orally or by way of an essay, or whatever the case might be, to describe for me, trace for me, American territorial acquisition, beginning with the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Now, what would you say? How did we get this territory here from the Appalachians to the Mississippi? When did this become part of us? How did we get the territory essentially from the Mississippi to the Rockies? When did that occur? How did we get this? Later in the year, we'll still talk about this. We'll talk about Texas. But could you talk, write, explain to me, trace American territorial acquisition 1776 up until 1848? We said a moment ago, or I said a moment ago, that the president at the time of the Mexican-American War was Polk. Polk believed in manifest destiny, widespread cultural belief. What was that belief at its core? Well, we have up here that America, its settlers, were destined to expand across North America. Destined, hence the word destiny, to expand across America, North America, all the way to the Pacific. There are three basic themes to manifest destiny, to have you further understand what this is all about. Theme number one, the bullet point, the special virtues of the American people and their institutions. In other words, why did we have this right to expand like this? Because, says manifest destiny, we the people, and our institutions, which oftentimes refers to our governmental institutions, though it may include other institutions as well, but primarily what we're talking about is our governmental institutions, our presidency, our 
courts, our Congress, the American people and their institutions, according to Manifest Destiny, it has special virtues, AKA it's better than anything else. It's that special. That's why we get to move forward according to the belief of Manifest Destiny. Theme number two, the mission of the United States, check out these words, is to redeem and remake the West, the entire West in the image of an agrarian America. That's our mission. Redeem it, take it, remake it into essentially agrarian, a large farm. Three, it's not only our destiny to do this, it's an irresistible destiny. As if to suggest we couldn't help ourselves if we wanted to. It's what it really means to be American. Irresistible destiny to accomplish this essential duty. Well, what is this essential duty? To expand westward, manifest destiny. We've now taken care of a number of different questions. We looked at the War of 1812, question 28, 34 Monroe Doctrine, 26 Mexican-American War, 27 the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. We're now looking at 29 Manifest Destiny. I'm gonna take this slide out, no need to look at that. Wonderful Course Hero uh, video on Manifest Destiny, which I put here now, but we're also gonna see it later. It's also gonna appear in my period five slideshow because Manifest Destiny doesn't stop with 1848. So we're gonna actually see this entire story replayed when we do period five. But right now, what I'd like to do is have you take a close look at, at a very famous Manifest Destiny image, the same one that I'm using as a backdrop today. There's no AP test, I don't think ever, that didn't include this image. Certainly it's gonna be on all my tests. It has to be, it's that famous. And what do we do with this image other than look at it? Well, there's lots of things we can do, but, but one thing I like to do, one thing a lot of AP teachers like to do, is to have you right now, wherever you are, just visually divide this image into four equal boxes. Just divide it into four equal boxes. And then what I'd like for you to do, we're gonna do what's called a quadrant analysis, just so we can really take a close look at this image, is look at the box that you have in the top right-hand corner and ask yourself, this question, what do you see? What do you see? And I want you just in your mind to list off all the things that you see. I'm gonna model this for you right now. I see one train, I see a second train, I see sailboats, I see what looks like a river, could be two rivers coming together. I see a bridge, I see what looks like the sun, I see clouds in the sky, and I see poles here attached with some kind of wire. Now let's do the bottom right hand quadrant. In your head, without me saying other, anything other than counting off, I'd like for you to say, what do you see? One, two, three, four, five, six. Now I'd like you to do the exact same thing for the left-hand quadrant. One, two, three, four, five, six. And some of you may have an eye for detail and are going well over six and that is fine. And now on your own without me saying anything, the top left-hand quadrant. And now I would like for you to look at the image in the center there, the woman. And I'd like for you to ask yourself the question, what is she holding in her left hand? What is that? What is that? And the answer is something that we've already talked about, a major development of the first industrial revolution. In fact, an interesting question I could ask you right now is in this picture where 
what evidence of the fact that this is occurring in the first industrial revolution, what evidence do you see? Ask yourself this question, what does she have in her right hand? Now, this particular image is rather dark. Uh, a lighter image, I think, suggests that, the, that what she's holding there is a book that says school book. And now that we've looked at the image, what I'd like to do, and I've been doing this all day, I've done this now for several years, is I just want to ask you, this is clearly, uh, you know, the message here is, is manifest destiny, but what I would like to ask you is, do you have any questions about the image? Are you, is there anything that you see, you go, hmm, that's kind of curious, I wonder what that's all about. Clearly the artist here has worked a great deal of thought into this. Everything is communicating to us. But there are a number of things when you start to think about it, you say, wait, what's the message here? A widespread cultural belief in westward expansion. Sure. The themes we just talked about. Sure. But do you have any specific questions? That's my question to you. And Ms. yes. McCartney? Yes. Um, sorry to interrupt you, but I think there's time for a break song. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Christina. We'll go just a couple minutes over and uh, let's see if I can have you. I've had great questions today. Um, it's about as far as we're going to go with it, but does anybody have anything? Well, period six, a lot of silence here today. I'll share with you something. A number of years ago, when I, when I first did, th did this, I had a ton of great questions. And one of them was this bridge back here. What is this? And what body of water is this? Based on, whoops, sorry, based on our study so far, when it comes to what body of water is this, there may be three or four logical and good possibilities. In the chat box, very quickly. Everybody, put your hands on your keyboards, on the keyboard, please. Oh, I'm seeing a great one here. Uh, I'm gonna go one, a three, two, one, and then I would like for you to give me a, a couple of guesses on what you think that could be. What body of water? Three, two, I want everybody in. If you don't have anything at all, question mark, one, send. Okay. So let's see what kind of answers we have, okay? Let's see what we got here. Chesapeake Bay, given how we've talked, is, is, is a, it's a good, reasonable answer. Atlantic Ocean, good, reasonable answer. Look at this, I see Chesapeake Bay twice. Uh, I see Hudson River, Mississippi River, all good, reasonable answers, okay? I see, uh, let's see, do I see a Mississippi? I see all of those. Uh, today, I've seen a, a couple of you said the Ohio River, all good, reasonable answers. Now, if we had to choose between Hudson, Ohio, Mississippi, Atlantic, and Chesapeake, an interesting question would be, which body of water makes most sense based on what we've learned so far? Let's see if I can get you all to vote on one of those right now. Hudson, Chesapeake, uh, Mississippi, Ohio, Atlantic Ocean, three, two, one, send. Okay. The man who painted this lived in New York. He lived in New York. If he's living in New York, painting in New York, it's quite possible we're talking either the Atlantic or the Hudson. Huh. I wonder what this is. Just for the fun of it, I wonder what this is. And so I'm going to leave you here with this right now, just really trying to encourage a closer look. But, but there are numerous, numerous questions like this. They keep coming up. What is the star on her forehead? For years, I have had this question put forward by one of you. And until today, I never had one of you offer up a reason where everybody went, oh, that really makes sense. Rather than me give that all to you, I'm asking you, what do you think that star is all, is all about? What are the white splotches near the pulled wagon? Well, those are uh, uh, skeleton remains. Uh, I've been asked, why is everything moving from left to right? Uh, from Sorry, from right to left, but the deer is moving from left 
to write. If this is a school book, what is the lesson that this figure wants this new world to learn? Is it just to write and to read? Is there more to it? What is this story down here? What is this story down here? And it goes on and on and on like that. Not that you'll ever need it for the test, but it's been fun over the years to do with you guys and uh, usually has led to, to considerable amount of discussion, especially when we're in a class and I can project this up onto the screen large, we can dim the lights, get everybody out of their seat, and you can come see it real close. That's as far as we are going today. I am going to now um, go back here to the wall space. I want to play a nice little song that Tristan uh, brought in for us, Frank, Frankie Valley, The Four Seasons. Here we go. Mr. Piconi, I don't think you're sharing the sound right now. Did you say you couldn't hear it? Yes. Okay, I see why. Okay, let's do it again. There we go. Yeah. Well, that's not gonna, okay, yes, it is gonna work. Um, Frankie Valley, let's see, should work. We are going to go back to the year 1962, yeah, the very beginning. We all remember that. Good. Now check these guys out, but they're going to start singing and we want you to join in, okay? I said okay. as far as we go. I'm now going to uh, end the recording and give you time to work on your PBLs. And of course, I'll be here in case you have any questions.